Lately, there have been several movies and TV shows which have aggravated audiences and critics for mistreatment of characters, primarily by having characters being significantly altered personality-wise, or by making decisions that go against their established morals. This treatment of character has widely been referred to as character assassination. Character assassination in movies is typically quite apparent, but in certain cases it can cause conflict between critics, particularly when it comes to popular franchises like Star Wars or Game of Thrones. In this video, I want to clearly establish what character assassination is and address several defenses that have been used for characters who have faced assassination. Let's first take a look at a clear-cut example of character assassination and explore exactly what the term entails, how a long-running and popular franchise established a character with clear moral standards, and how a subsequent sequel released years later destroyed said character and the franchise he was attached to. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. John McClane is the main character in the film Die Hard. When we are first introduced to him, we learn that he lives in New York and is visiting his wife Holly in Los Angeles. Through dialogue with the character Argyle, it is revealed that John and Holly's respective jobs separated them and that their relationship is rocky as a result. John waits for Holly at her office Christmas party before terrorists seize control of the building and take Holly as a hostage. John then spends the rest of the film attempting to stop the terrorists and save the hostages. In the first film, McLean's morals are clearly established. He is someone who is not particularly strategic or even intelligent. However, he is very resourceful, making use of materials the building provides him with which he uses to gain the upper hand against the terrorists. And he has no qualms about killing the terrorists, oftentimes delivering clever one-liners afterwards. Next time you have a chance to kill someone, don't hesitate. Thanks for the advice. But there are two key character traits that define John McClane's character which stand above the rest. The first being McClane's tenacity. His first instinct is to find a way to inform the police about the situation. This is what he spends the majority of the film's first act attempting to do. When the police eventually do arrive, he listens to the instructions of Sergeant Al Powell and decides to lay low. It's only after it becomes clear that the police are both ill-equipped and incompetent compared to the terrorist leader Hans that John springs back into action and takes matters into his own hands. Throughout the rest of the film, he walks on broken glass, fights tooth and nail with Hans's key mercenary Carl, and jumps off the roof of the building. And all of this is because McLean is stubborn, and he refuses to back down if there is no one else who can help. But even more important than John's tenacity is his unlikely trait, empathy. Early in the film, McLean witnesses the death of Joseph Takaki, the president of Nakatomi Trading. Witnessing this clearly has an effect on John and serves as an early motivation for him. Why the fuck didn't you stop him, John? Because then you'd be dead too, asshole. Obviously, his wife is among the hostages being held by Hans, and John clearly cares about her. But one of the most important scenes for John's character is Ellis's death scene. John meets Ellis early in the film's first act and learns that he is a drug addict and has been hitting on his wife. Every interaction he has with Ellis should lead John to despising him. But midway through the film, Ellis decides to offer himself to the terrorists, which allows Hans to reveal John's name to both the police and the press. Ellis tells John that if he doesn't give himself up, they're going to kill him. With everyone listening, John calmly tries to convince Ellis to tell him that he doesn't know John in order to save Ellis' life. Ellis, what have you told him? I told him we were old friends and you were my guest at the party. Ellis, you shouldn't be doing this. Tell me about it. They want you to tell them what the detonators are. They know people are listening. They want the detonators or they're gonna kill me. John, didn't you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Babe, put away the gun. This is radio, not television. <laughs> Hans, this asshole is not my friend. I just met him tonight. I don't know him. Jesus Christ, Ellis, these people are gonna kill you. Tell them you don't know me. John, how can you say that after all these years, huh? John. But when Ellis refuses, Hans kills him. Where are they, or shall I shoot another one? Sooner or later, I might get to someone you do care about. Go fuck yourself, Hans. Above nearly everything that John endures in the film, this seems to be what impacts him the most. The fact that a foolish and misguided man got himself killed, and all that John could do is desperately attempt to talk sense into him. But it was no use. Hey, pal, you out there? I'm here, John. I'm here. You gotta believe me, there's nothing I could do. This is because one of John's key character traits is that he is empathetic toward others. He is vicious when it comes to villainous people, and he becomes frustrated by people who stand in his way. But John McClane cares about innocent people. With this first film, we can draw several definitive character traits from John McClane. He clearly cares about his family, he is attached to his job, and he has a very sarcastic personality. But the two traits which largely define who McClane is under the surface are his tenacity and empathy. There are plenty of criticisms that can be levied against the film's subsequent sequels, but what kept the franchise intact was that John McClane was always John McClane. In some films he had a strong relationship with his family, in other films he did not. 
In some films, John was more worn out and old than he was in others, particularly in Live Free or Die Hard, where McLean being old and out of touch with the technologically advanced world plays a crucial role in the film's narrative. But no matter what situation the films place John in, and no matter how significant of a time jump was between each film, the core character traits of John McLean stayed intact, thus making the sequels to Die Hard consistent with John McLean's character. You know what you get for being a hero? Nothing. You get shot at. You get a little pat on the back, blah, blah, blah. a boy. Divorced. Kids don't want to talk to you. Just my kid. Nobody wants to be that guy. Then why are you doing this? Because there's nobody else to do it right now. That's why. Believe me, if there was somebody else to do it, I would let them do it. But there's not. So we're doing it. And that's what makes you that guy. However, all of that changed after the release of 2013's A Good Day to Die Hard. In the film, McLean is no longer the sarcastic, empathetic, and reluctant protagonist that the previous films established him as. Instead, he spends the entire film complaining and doesn't hold any investment in protecting anyone other than himself and his son. Which means that McLean has no qualms about engaging in destructive shootouts and car chases in the middle of crowded areas. Early in the film, McLean is stuck without a vehicle during a chase and needs to commandeer a car in order to continue the pursuit. In order to do this, he attempts to wave down cars by standing in the middle of the street. When a car strikes him and the driver begins yelling at him in Russian, John punches the man in the face and steals his car. He shows no regard for what he is doing and berates the man for speaking a language he doesn't understand. Following this, he breaks through the wall of an overpass and runs over dozens of cars on the highway filled with innocent civilians. And what is John's reaction to this blatant disregard for the lives of innocent people? Sorry, man. Sorry. In addition to his lack of empathy for innocent people, throughout the entire film, McLean shows no tenacity. He complains about his situation constantly and only fights to save himself, Jack, and of course, to do his thing. What's that? I can kill a bad guy! That's your thing! The film audiences were left with was a lifeless third-person shooter movie following hollow and uncharismatic characters going from set piece to set piece, shooting random drone villains with assault rifles before completing the final level of the video game at Chernobyl. Now, could John McClane have gone from being a sarcastic and reluctant protagonist to being a cynical, unempathetic cop? Yes. But in order for the audience to understand this character's position, the writers need to take the time to explain why John McClane is acting out of character. Even the late entry Live Free or Die Hard, which featured an older McLean, still showed care for other people through both his actions and dialogue. That's crazy. First time I heard the concept of a fire sale, I actually thought it would be cool if anyone ever really did it. Just hit the reset button and melt the system just for fun. Hey, it's not a system. It's a country. You're talking about people, all right? A whole country full of people. Sitting at home, alone, scared to death in their houses, all right? So if you're done with your little nostalgic moment, maybe you can think a little bit and help me catch these guys. Consequentially, when a sequel was released only a few years later and McLean was not displaying any of his core character traits, audiences did not buy into the new approach to the iconic character, leading them to the logical assumption that the writers fundamentally misunderstood the core character traits of John McLean. This is the basis of all forms of character assassination. When there is a character who is part of a large franchise, it can be fascinating for that character to become someone almost unrecognizable in comparison to their previous selves following years of development. Because no matter where a character in a story begins, it's always possible for said character to transform into someone else entirely. Long-form TV shows tend to do this excellently, by showing the audience a multitude of factors which result in a character changing into a radically different person. But the important part is that in order for this change to be effective, the writers need to earn the new position of said character. So with all that being said, let's take a look at a few explanations for character assassination and explore the significance of development in order to avoid this writing trap. People change. This is one of the many explanations used to defend the radically different position of Luke Skywalker in Star Wars The Last Jedi. The basic argument is that people change over time and that heroes are not flawless. Some folks seem to want their Star Wars characters to figuratively be frozen in carbonite, staying the same, unchanged, no arc. And The Last Jedi says, wait, 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 wait. Luke is only human, he's flawed too. As is true in the real world, people are just people, messy and complicated. I think this is where Ryan lost a lot of people and I honestly understand your frustration. Luke should be better than this, but honestly, that's kind of what this film is about. It's why Luke is the way he is. He's not perfect, even our heroes have flaws. Once again, this is a classic example of development between films being the primary issue. You can change any character and alter some of their core traits, but the only way to do this is for it to be developed. Otherwise, the jump between films is going to be jarring. 
and if the character in question begins betraying their core values, this still falls into the realm of character assassination. People change is not in itself an argument. If it was, then characters could jump into random points of the story with no explanation as to how they've been altered. In Breaking Bad, if you jump from the scene where Walter White learned that he had lung cancer to the last few minutes of Felina, this would be rather jarring for audiences. In that case, there is in fact an extensive story explaining how a character went from being a passive high school teacher to a drug kingpin. But if we do not see this story, then Walt would be acting inconsistent with what we understood about him, and showing a flashback isolated from context would not be enough to explain the change. For any character arc or alteration, careful development is required if you want to avoid causing cognitive dissonance for the audience. Regret or weakness? This was the primary argument used by Star Wars Explained in his video about Luke Skywalker in Star Wars The Last Jedi. It was instinct that caused him to ignite his lightsaber in Ben's hut. But he didn't act on it, and he immediately knew he had made a mistake. He was immediately ashamed of what he had done and what he'd felt, even though he hadn't actually done anything. The idea occurred to him, and then after like half a second of considering it, he decided not to and was horrified with himself for even thinking about it. Last time he approached the dark side it was because Vader had threatened Leia and Luke lashed out in anger, pleasing the Emperor. This time he responded to his fear of what Ben would become. He knew where it led and wanted to stop it, but immediately regretted it. In the flashback involving Luke and Ben, we see that Luke considered killing Ben based on what he saw in Ben's mind. He did in fact ignite his lightsaber, but instantly regretted it. The trouble is that this action, no matter how brief, is still out of character considering all of Luke's core traits established in the original trilogy. What's fundamentally detrimental to this scene is that a core trait established in all three films was that Luke will always go out of his way to protect his friends and family. He does so in Star Wars by going out of his way to save Leia, and by helping C-3PO and R2-D2 complete their mission. He also abandons his training in The Empire Strikes Back in favor of attempting to rescue Han and Leia from Vader, which results in him losing a hand. And possibly the most popularly referenced example is Return of the Jedi where Luke not only rescued Han from Jabba the Hutt, but also surrendered himself to Vader, clinging to the hope that he could turn him to the light side. Once again, there is no development in The Last Jedi provided outside of vague exposition that explains Luke's radically altered values. For an example of a core value in a film and how it can be betrayed, let's take a look at Mr. Miyagi in The Karate Kid. Mr. Miyagi's core value established early on in The Karate Kid is that he will always go out of his way to avoid a fight. Mr. Miyagi prominently teaches this philosophy to Daniel, and demonstrates it in practice by fighting the Cobra Kai students to stop them from attacking Daniel rather than out of anger or revenge. Mr. Miyagi never throws the first punch, and always fights out of self-defense or to defend others. It's also what is crucial in separating Daniel and Mr. Miyagi from the antagonists, who quite literally followed the philosophy Similarly to Return of the Jedi, Mr. Miyagi spends the entirety of the Karate Kid Part 2 attempting to avoid a fight. Throughout the film, he tries to convince an old friend whom he betrayed to forgive him in spite of Sato continuing to torment Mr. Miyagi and directly confronting him on multiple occasions. This core trait is illustrated in every single Karate Kid film. It is Mr. Miyagi's defining character trait. Enemy deserve no mercy. Oh. With that being said, let's say there were a hypothetical Karate Kid sequel where Mr. Miyagi learned that Daniel had been bullied to the point of hospitalization. Enraged, Mr. Miyagi then decided to confront the bully at his house and beat his father while forcing the bully to watch. In the middle of the deed, however, Mr. Miyagi stops in shame, leaves the country to seclude himself in Okinawa, and abandons Daniel. In this example, it is irrelevant that Mr. Miyagi stopped himself in the middle of the deed and felt ashamed. He still betrayed his core value of always avoiding a fight and therefore is acting out of character. And if the film in question does not go out of its way to explain why Mr. Miyagi's values have been altered, then Mr. Miyagi would be the victim of character assassination. A moment where a character nearly commits to an unthinkable action is not something which always comes at the cost of character consistency. The example from The Last Jedi has very similar framing to the scene from Terminator 2 Judgment Day where Sarah Connor attempts to kill Miles Dyson to prevent the war. The core difference between these two scenes is that Terminator 2 Judgment Day spends the majority of its runtime established in Sarah's off-screen development through dialogue between characters. In addition to this, Sarah's actions throughout the first and second acts solidify the development which the dialogue suggested. Therefore, this moment makes sense based on everything which has been established about her across both films. She is someone who has made impulsive decisions due to her fear of the future and will stop at nothing to prevent Judgment Day. In spite of this, Sarah is also a mother, and the sight of Dyson's wife and son was enough to snap her out of her instinctive behavior. This is a brilliant example of a character making a rash decision and later stopping herself out of regret and shock. The reason it is effective is because of careful development with their character which built to this moment. All of it is consistent with everything which the audience understands about Sarah, making it both emotionally impactful and consistent. Just as it is with character change, a character can have a significant alteration of their core values. 
but if they regret an out-of-character decision they make or stop themselves in the middle of the deed, this does not accommodate for missing character development. Foreshadowing This is the most popular defense used to explain the actions of Daenerys Targaryen in the penultimate episode of Game of Thrones Season 8. In the episode, Daenerys is shown as being frail and disconnected from her advisors. She is not eating and seems heavily aggressive toward others. Presumably, this is because of the death of one of her dragons in Miss Sunday. In the episode, Danny's forces successfully overpower the Golden Company, and Drogon manages to obliterate Euron Greyjoy's fleet. With civilians shouting for surrender and the Lannister army at a standstill, the city bells begin ringing. Tyrion had stated early in the episode that the bells signified surrender. However, atop Drogon, Danny seems to suffer an emotional breakdown, and inexplicably decides to decimate the entirety of King's Landing by flying Drogon back and forth in a method which resembles the way one mows a lawn. Since there was no dialogue with Danny explaining her thought process before the attack, and there were no reaction shots of Danny whilst flying on Drogon late in the episode, this led to immense speculation between fans of the show regarding her state of mind. Many of them pointed to references in the show which illustrated that Danny cared about the lives of innocent people. Those who pointed to said references believed that her surgically incinerating hundreds of thousands of innocent women and children is out of character for her. If you want to sit on the throne your ancestors built, you must win it. That will mean blood on your hands before the thing is done. The blood of my enemies, not the blood of innocents. I don't want another child's bones dropped at my feet. Those who defended the writing of the episode pointed to foreshadowing with her character based on earlier actions Danny took, and claimed that these scenes implied that Danny had the potential to go mad. I am the dragon's daughter, and I swear to you that those who would harm you will die screaming. You will not hear me scream. I will. We will take back what was stolen from me and destroy those who have wronged me. We will lay waste to armies and burn cities to the ground. The trouble with this argument, just like the argument that people change, is that foreshadowing does not account for missing character or plot development. Usually in a film, foreshadowing is something that can be used by a filmmaker to hint to the audience that a future event will occur. Oftentimes, this is something that can make for a unique second viewing. When you rewatch a film with foreshadowing, you can pick up on subtle details inserted into seemingly irrelevant scenes. For instance, one of the most effective uses of foreshadowing is found in The Dark Knight, centralizing around the character of Harvey Dent. This is achieved through the use of subtle visuals involving Harvey's body language, and it is most prominent in his statement that he makes to Bruce and Rachel. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. These hints provided through dialogue and visual storytelling imply Dent turning from his altruistic ways. However, these are not examples of development for Harvey's arc. They are merely hints which the audience may or may not pick up on which hold similar value to easter eggs. The development for Harvey's turn is achieved through Rachel's death and the Joker sharing his philosophy with Dent. This is enough for Harvey to choose to take matters into his own hands and take vengeance against those he felt were responsible for Rachel's death outside of the constrictions of the law. Therefore, the turn is developed and the foreshadowing is used for a payoff that is achieved both visually and through the use of dialogue. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Foreshadowing is not something that is a substitute for character development. Instead, it should go hand in hand with it and can be excellent for recontextualizing the audience's view toward the characters or plot of a film. But the same fundamental principle of a character's actions needed to remain consistent still apply in this instance. Foreshadowing will not explain a character's actions if they betray their core values, and the blame for the inconsistencies will be directed at poor writing and nonsense explanations provided by either the writers or characters in the piece of media. I tried to make peace with Cersei. She used their innocence as a weapon against me. She thought it would cripple me. Are you serious? Character assassination relates to instances where a character commits to an action or behaves in a way which contradicts what has been established about them previously. When you write a strong character, you are going to establish certain values and traits which that character holds. If you wish for these values to be altered or recontextualized, then meticulous development is required for the alteration to be smooth. Otherwise, the change will be arbitrary and cause cognitive dissonance for the audience. Character's change is not an explanation as it does not account for missing character development. A character having regret does not explain said character committing to an out-of-character decision. And foreshadowing is not something which takes the place of character development, and instead is designed to go hand-in-hand -hand with it and serve as setup for a later payoff. So when writing a story, remember the importance of central characters remaining consistent. So long as your character stays true to their core values, consistency will be maintained. But when they begin betraying these values, that is the earliest sign that your character is headed down the road to assassination. What's funny there? <laughs> Can't tell you. <laughs> it's not you. I love these outfits. <laughs> you guys are looking good. 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>